makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Dubai with some special coverage this hour from the 28th UN Climate Change Conference. It's 28th. That's why we call it COP28. Now, we have a host of top interviews this hour, including the White House National Climate Advisor, Ali Zaidi, an exclusive interview with Adani Green's chief executive, Amit Singh, and we'll also be joined by the BlackRock Vice Chair, Philip Hildebrand. Now, first thing is first, activists and observers at COP28 here in Dubai have all condemned some pretty controversial comments from the summit's presidents. Now, Sultan al Jaber is reported to have said that the science does not support calls for the total phasing out of fossil fuels to keep the global temperature rising to 1.5 degrees. Now, COP28 officials say the story is an attempt to undermine al Jaber, who also heads up the UAE-owned Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. Meanwhile, the Microsoft founder and billionaire clean energy investor Bill Gates tells us he sees the world's chances of keeping temperature rising below 2 uh, Celsius centigrades fading fast. Now this, as bankers and the investment industry explore new funding structures and partnerships on COP28's finance day. So to get us started, our senior reporter for climate, Akshat Rati, now joins us. Akshat, thank you for joining us. Now, you are a COP veteran. You follow this closely. You have a green newsletter. You have a great podcast. How are we doing? So the first few days have gone smoothly. Uh, we've had big announcements, some of them with real money attached to them. Uh, so the loss and damage fund, which is supposed to get developed countries to pay for damages uh, in developing countries, has been agreed upon. There is $500 million in there. Yeah. Not a small. lot. It feels small. It is. But to get it going, that okay. is what you needed at least. And so we've got over that hurdle. There have been a number of announcements on health. There will be some, I assume, on finance today uh, that are hundreds of millions of dollars. There's some private announcements coming from the UAE trying to invest in billions of dollars, a $30 billion fund to invest in clean energy around the world. Uh, but we are yet to see how detailed those proposals are. So a lot gets announced, but the real rubber hits the road only after COP. Okay, I like that. The real rubber only hits the road after COP. What about methane? Are we getting pledges? I mean, this should be a low-hanging fruit, right? So methane is actually a really good example because the first announcement around it was made in COP26 two years ago. And since then, we've had a series of government interventions and pressure to try and get more governments to agree and get oil companies to join the fight. And so this time around, the number of countries who've signed up to the pledge has grown, and oil companies have come and actually given money to try and increase the work they do to reduce methane emissions. That is the quickest, cheapest, fastest solution that we can deploy right now to try and slow down the warming that we are seeing. So, oh, actually, at the same time, so we had the vice president of the U.S. We don't have the president. We had the Chinese climate envoy. We don't have the Chinese president. I mean, we really need those two at the table if something concrete is going to happen. We do. The good thing is that before coming into COP28, the leaders did meet in San Francisco at the, uh, at the summit, and they did put out a communique on climate very specifically. So they agreed to collaborate, and that's going to mean a lot for the negotiators because even though the leaders didn't show up, it's really the negotiators who do the job. They are empowered by the leaders, and the leaders seem to have given a mandate. I mean, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the COP president. He is the chief executive of ADNOC. But at the same time, there's a lot of preparation, which is why we have this loss and damage. So how do you think he's doing? So, so far, yes, you're right. Uh, in terms of his deliverables in the first five days, it seems like he has, right? Loss and damage, getting it out the door, really important. But it is what happens at the very end. And that requires him to bring 200 countries together. So the criticisms that he's got, these stories that have come out, are going to try and maybe undermine the trust that is required among these countries. And we are going to be reporting over the next two weeks to figure out if the diplomats who will make the call are listening to these stories and are less trusting of him or not. So uh, we asked, uh, also asked Bill Gates about this, and he was very measured. But just to be clear, like, how do you see the, the phasing out of fossil fuel going? Like, how quickly is that needed? We had the IEA report last, last year, yes. but how quickly does that need to be to hit the targets? Well, it has to be quick. So phasing down, the reduction in the use of fossil fuel has to be quick. Do we need to get to zero fossil fuels? If we can, that will make solving climate change easier. But if we don't, which may be the case because there are certain places like flying where we do need fossil fuels or we need them in developing countries where we don't have renewable energy, 
So maybe some use of fossil fuels is necessary from a development point of view, but then we need carbon capture technology. So scenarios to get to a stable temperature are hundreds. Most of them require a rapid phase down of fossil fuels this decade and very close to zero by mid-century. I mean, I love having our chat on. Yesterday I spoke to an investor and I've been dying actually to ask you what you thought about, you know, energy consumption being lost. And so this is the idea. And I, so I'm doing it live on TV, like the yes. beauty of Bloomberg TV. So he basically says he's trying to change, you know, LED light bulbs. He's trying to argue that one of the most important things is that when energy goes from A to B, so from the producer to the consumer, it doesn't get lost. Fertilizers, for example, a lot of gas wastage with, with the current agriculture. Like, how important is that we don't waste the energy instead of, you know, as much as we phase it out? It's the most important, least sexy solution, and that's why we don't talk about it. So we've talked about tripling renewable energy. That's another goal that may be set by the 200 countries. Within that, there's also a goal to double energy efficiency. That's the idea. You use the same amount of energy, but you do more work because you waste less. And we kind of don't talk about wasting less, but it's a really, really important solution. One very good place to see it is India. So India moved from the incandescent bulb, you know, the 100 watt bulbs that we had, which were hot, to LEDs within a decade because government incentives, but also they're cheaper to buy and cheaper to run because you're consuming 5 watts, 95% reduction. Yeah, it's incredible. You see, what do you say? That least energy sexy, efficiency. but but no, least I know energy, sexy, but more important. But the most important. There you go. That's what we do on the Pulse. So Bloomberg's, of course, senior reporter for climate, Akshat Ratti. Now, we also spoke to Bill Gates. He says that the world probably won't meet the Paris Agreement's goal of keeping the rise in global temperatures below two degrees Celsius. However, he did praise the COP28 summit for making progress on tackling climate change, despite some of these geopolitical tensions across the globe. Now, I spoke to him on the sidelines of the summit here in Dubai. Well, we have to outcompete fossil fuels. Now, to do that properly, they, you know, they shouldn't get subsidies. And in fact, a carbon tax uh, over time should be put on so that the new, you know, say the electric car or the plane that uses hydrogen, uh, the fact it doesn't emit carbon, you're helping it uh, get adoption. Those companies have skills, you know, if you want to sequester carbon or, you know, nuclear waste or there's a lot of skills. Uh, if you want to make biofuels, uh, you know, some of those companies will take the capital and skills they have. Uh, you know, so I wouldn't, you know, say, OK, I wish they weren't there. You know, people st still, you know, there's no country that can say, OK, we have zero emissions. Uh, you know, people want to drive to work. You know, in fact, the excess supply, uh, when Russia cut off its supply, you know, the world was sort of glad that that, that was available. And so, yes, oil and gas uh, needs to be outcompeted, and those companies need to join the, the effort. I, I know you look at a lot of technologies and a lot of innovation, but is there one thing that you've been most excited about in, in the past five years or that you're, you're most excited about for the future? I know we talk about nuclear fuel. We, I mean, we talk a lot, a lot about the, the really big, you know, exciting stuff. What are you excited about? Well, it, you know, I love all my children uh, and I have these hundred companies and, you know, I never knew that uh, we'd get a new way to make steel or cement or beef. Uh, it's fair to say that if we can get either nuclear fission or fusion to be safe and broadly accepted and uh, very economic, because it's not weather dependent, it would be very complementary to the large amount of solar and wind that we're putting into our electric system. And so I'm, a, I'm biased. I'm a huge investor in, in both fission and fusion and hoping that uh, it comes in time. We, we can't count on it. Um, you know, fission it has been too expensive and fusion doesn't uh, exist yet. But f fusion, 15 years from now? Like, what's your, I, I know it's a guess at the moment. But well, of the, of the four companies I'm invested in, uh, one of them, Commonwealth Fusion, has a credible path, things will have to go well, uh, that in the late 2030s, they'd be making electricity and, and start to scale it up. So uh, that's an aspiration, but it's a great company. And we have three others that aren't quite 
uh, that early, but you know, are within five to ten years of that. I mean, we're in a strange place in, in the planet right now because there's a lot of unknowns. It's AI, it's technology, it's of course climate change. Do you find leaders distracted? Or are they still putting climate change as some of their top priorities? Well, we can't have as our only priority. I mean, you know, we still need to buy vaccines and bed nets and, you know, when there's a, a war, you know, that properly demands attention and even the aid budget, you know, for those refugees and everything. It, it is, I wish there hadn't been a pandemic or Ukraine war or Middle East unrest. Those are going to take away from the amount of tension we have on continuing to make health progress and climate change. So, uh, you know, those are, are bad developments. If you'd only seen 10,000 people come, you know, versus 35,000 last time, you might have said, wow, we are really getting distracted. Instead, twice as many came here, including a lot of the big businesses. So the signs I'm seeing are that while we still have to deal with those things and we have limited resources, so we have to spend them well, that climate progress uh, is, is moving ahead, even though we won't we meet our highest uh, aspiration. Uh, Bill Gates, one final question on, on AI. Do you, uh, how, how does that fit into your vision for? Well, AI is such a powerful technology. And, you know, this recent advance where the AI can basically read and write, uh, that's going to affect every human activity. And so we're using AI to find new drugs. We're using AI to look at climate change. Um, and so all of our companies are going to move faster because AI helps them explore different solutions uh, and move a lot, a lot better. So, you know, certainly for challenges like this, uh, AI is very much our friend. Bill Gates there, the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now coming up, what can financiers achieve at COP28 on Finance Day? We sit down with BlackRock's vice chair, Philip Hildebrand, to discuss the biggest challenges in unlocking investment in green projects. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Dubai from COP28. Now, here are some of the other top stories this morning. The Israeli military has stepped up its offensive against Hamas in southern Gaza. Now, UN monitors say the expanded offensive has forced hundreds of thousands of displaced Palestinians to crowd into southern parts of the Strip. The Hamas-run health authority in Gaza say at least 15,000 people have been killed since fighting began in October. At the same time, a U.S. Navy ship has responded to a flurry of drone and missile attacks against commercial ships operating in the Red Sea, underscoring the potential for the conflict to widen. And India's ruling BJP Part 1 party won three crucial state elections and unseated the opposition in two of them, strengthening Prime Minister Modi's bid for a third term in office. The BJP retained power in Madhya Pradesh and took control of the state legislatures from its rival, the Indian National Congress, in two other states. Now, the opposition's loss is a boost for the ruling party ahead of the general election next year. Hawaiian holding shares have soared at 200 percent after rival Alaska Air agreed to buy it in a takeover worth about $1.9 billion. Now, Alaska is to pay $18 per share in a deal that includes about $900 million of Hawaiian's debt. The move challenges the Biden administration's aggressive stance on mergers that has already derailed the partnership. Coming up, the U.S. pledges $3 billion for climate aid to developing countries. We'll be joined by the National Climate Advisor to the White House, Ali Zaidi. He's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, the U.S. has pledged to contribute $3 billion towards a U.N. fund to help developing countries with climate change. The Biden administration's commitment follows a steady increase in grants and loans to climate change 
in recent years. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined by Ali Zaidi, the National Climate Advisor to the White House. Thank you for making the time good for, first of all, coming to the Green Summit, but also coming on, on TV with me. There has been good things about COP28. We're only in day four. We still have another, like, 12 days to, to get through. What are you most optimistic about, and what are you disappointed by? Look, I think, number one, we're really getting our act together on super pollutants like methane, like hydrofluorocarbons. The United States made a big announcement cracking down on methane pollution, good for our environment, good for public health and for workers. Um, we're also seeing progress on renewable deployment. The U.S., when the vice president was here, joined in a commitment to triple renewable capacity by 2030. That's a really big deal. Um, but I think there's a, a lot of conversation that needs to be had about how we uh, lift up our communities in the process. Uh, I think the issues of transition and of justice are important ones to have part and parcel with GHG. Um, and then I think we've also got to have a conversation about how, over time, uh, we reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, put those emissions in our rearview mirror. So sh should a phasing out of fossil fuel be in the final communique? I know there's a lot of controversy also because we're here in the UAE. And I know we have to be tempered, but like, what would you like to see at the end of the day? You know, we've had a lot of discussion about this in multilateral fora before. The G7, we talked about uh, abatement um, and emissions reductions from fossil fuels. We've got to build on that. Uh, the only way to go is forward to make progress, build on the G7 statement. But, I mean, the U.S. also has LNG. I think it's increasing capacity. Again, how do you marry the two? Is it a transition phase that then will come down, or what should investors be looking for in the transition? Yeah, look, the fact that we have expanding load growth in the United States is a positive sign uh, of the massive amount of manufacturing that Joe Biden's been able to bring back home all across the U.S., that's not a problem. Our opportunity is to meet that demand with growing clean energy, and it's an opportunity that's not just going to be met by renewables and storage, but also nuclear, hydropower, um, uh, geothermal, where we've seen announcements just this week. So I think the answer is not slowing down uh, or giving ourselves a longer bridge. It's just building those technologies more quickly. And I know a lot of investors say, look at the U.S., they've done the inflation reduction, had that will really help in bringing some of these technologies' costs down. Overall, a lot of investors want a carbon market. Like, when will we get some kind of comprehensive template of how to deal with this? I think we've got a comprehensive template in the Inflation Reduction Act, in the bipartisan infrastructure law. And as the president said when he went to the last G20, this is a playbook he wants replicated around the world. We're seeing a race to the top on this sort of industrial strategy, figuring out a comprehensive approach to tackle the climate crisis. It's working in the United States. We want others to come in behind that. We spoke to Bill Gates yesterday. He, he, I mean, he says he's optimistic because he's getting quite a lot of money and the funds that are needed to, to push with renewable energy, but he's not optimistic that we'll reach the targets set by the Paris Agreement. What's frustrating for you? Is there something that we should be going faster to get it done? We've got to go faster on everything. For the countries that continue to say that they should be able to build unabated coal plants uh, in 2023, um, we got to get them out of that game. Uh, for folks who look at parts of the economy, like the industrial sector, and say, that's too hard to abate, we don't need to go there, they've got to come to the table. Um, I think there are a number of places where folks can step up. That's why the United States shows up to dialogues like this. That's why Vice President Harris was here because we've got to push everybody to look at every sector of the economy and scale up and push through some of the barriers that we're seeing around siting and permitting, supply chain. We've got to be able to deal with those. We're dealing with them in the states, and we've got to work with allies and partners to make that easier around the world. But to convince countries not to build more you know, coal-fired plants or to shut them down, is it just money, the transfer of money? Will that get the job done? De-risking the technologies is a big part of it. The Inflation Reduction Act will knock down the price of a lot of these clean technologies by about a quarter. That's why we're confident that for every ton of emissions we reduce in the United States because of the president's policies, we'll reduce a ton or two everywhere else in the world as well. So it's about knocking down the price of the technology, reducing the cost of capital, increasing uh, folks' ability to move quickly because of policy environments that enable it. 
Ali Zaidi, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. He's, of course, a national climate advisor to the White House. We'll have plenty more from the Green Summit here at COP28. Coming up, the Adani Green Energy Chief Executive also joins us here at COP28 Climate Summit. Uh, we'll have him for an exclusive conversation. And then because it is Finance Day, I've heard, of course, of a lot of solutions also uh, for maybe some of the carbon credits. Some of them say, look, it's just cheating. Others are trying to put them in parcels that may be cheating for a while, but gets us at the end of the day to the climate transition or to the transition quicker. So I'll also have a conversation with the vice chair of BlackRock. He's Phil, Philip Hildebrand. That's coming up shortly. And this is Boom. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Aqua here in Dubai from COP28. Now, there have been a couple of wins, some of them saying, look, if you look at the methane pledge, that's certainly something that was expected, but still it will make quite a big difference going forward in terms of some of the leaks, and therefore will get us closer to some of the Paris Agreement pledges. Now, let's also go straight to Youssef Kamel Din, who's in the blue zone. It's uh, about an hour from where I am. I'm at the green summit of Bloomberg, but he's in the blue zone with an important guest. Youssef. Thanks, Francine. Stocks of companies owned by Gautam Adami are rallying, and they're rallying hard, adding to gains last week, which saw more than $5.5 billion added to the billionaire's net worth. Uh, it comes after India's a top court concluded hearings in a lawsuit where the market's regulator is probing wide-ranging allegations of corporate malfeasance against the conglomerate. Uh, joining us now is uh, Amit Singh. He's the CEO of Adani Green Energy. I mean, I want to start off with COP28. You just arrived a few hours ago. What kind of meetings have you lined up and what do you hope to get out of this conference? Yeah, sure. I think uh, India's decarbonization journey is really getting started. If you look at where we are today and our goals for 2030 of 500 gigawatt, Adani Green is playing a big role. And, uh, you know, we have 8.4 gigawatt of install base and we plan to get to 45 gigawatt. Uh, you know, we can't get there if we are maintaining our pace. So we really need to up the ante and increase our uh, pace of installation and operational capacity every year. So we're planning to grow to 5 gigawatt per year next year. And, you know, here in COP, I'm really looking to engage with key stakeholders, look to uh, understand what the world is doing, but also make a very strong case of how the uh, rest of the world can learn from India's journey in renewable, where we really, you know, uh, move very quickly, very uh, uh, fast as well. So. I mean, for India, the challenge is more about supply chains rather yeah. than it is about the language necessarily or about sure. the goals. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, if you look at uh, this kind of a scale and speed, it's very important to localize the supply chain. And this is really what we have tried to do. Uh, we've really lo localized, uh, if you look at solar, uh, we have looked at localizing our tracker, uh, making sure that there is a lot of indigenous component. We continue to build on to that and also look at localizing all other equipment which goes into it. Uh, we have a sister company which is just uh, uh, commissioned uh, 5.2 megawatt wind turbine, uh, which is going to be the biggest in India which uh, we are going to use. And uh, really, I think if we want to bring speed at this, uh, localization is very important. At the same time, it also helps with local job creation. Uh, when we execute these mega projects, we need to take the people along. We need to take, uh, make sure that the people who work with are contributing and benefiting yeah. from it. So, yeah, it, it, it is really the name of the game. Adani Group stocks yeah. are soaring. I was talking about this at the beginning of the show, but just today... The group has added $9.8 billion in market capitalization. The theory, according to some of the people we've spoken to, is that this is related to the BJP state election gains. It clearly has uh, initiated some buying interest in Adani. Maybe you get more visibility on some of the infrastructure-related projects. Uh, do you agree with that? Could there be more coming your way beyond just the political stability, new projects for 2024? Yeah. I think, you know, in India, the, the bidding is very open uh, book tenders, and I think a lot of those tenders are essentially, uh, uh, you know, available every year. I think the stock market really looks at stability of policy and stability of governance. I think uh, 
So uh, I won't comment on what happened this morning, but I think a stable policy, uh, a positive and progressive policy combined with really economic progress we are making is what I think our stockholders and investors are recognizing, and, and we hope to continue to drive in that direction. I mean, in terms of deploying CapEx into the yeah. new year, right? So you're talking about political stability, so you can ride those coattails. You've got a government that is keen to do what it can in terms of the transition. What's going to get deployed for capital expenditures into renewables in the new year? Yeah, so if you look at our stated goals, we are projecting approximately $1.5 billion of CapEx for this year, uh, which will essentially mean that we will install 3 gigawatt new capacity by end of financial year uh, this year. Uh, next year, we're looking to grow that to 5 gigawatt plus, which translates into three plus billion dollars of investment. If you look at our stated goals of 45 gigawatt, we are talking about a you know a capital outlay of 22 billion dollars, um, and we we are very well funded. Uh, you know we have a very strong support from our uh, stakeholders and shareholders, uh, and uh, th that's the projected plan which we are going to execute and uh, and achieve the essentially our goals, but also India's decarbonization goals. When you look at the example of Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and sort of many other countries that have uh, led the way with collaborations in terms of bringing know-how in, right? So yeah. that is where the link is with uh, Total Energy's involvement and equity participation. Yeah. Could you get us up to speed with that? Sure. Total has been actually a great partner uh, in this uh, company. They hold today a 19.7% equity in my company. Um, and uh, this has really grown from strength to strength. Uh, they also own on a project level 2.1 gigawatt 50-50 joint venture. And they are uh, also renewing interest uh, in investing additional $300 million plus uh, in another joint venture which uh, we are embarking on. So uh, really that partnership uh, brings multiple benefits. They, they are also uh, our board member uh, which helps with uh, you know, uh, getting a good governance practices shared uh, between the two companies. Uh, and also we, we share back and forth a lot of good practices, business practices, and renewable industry is a bit new. Uh, a lot of experiences in India they, they are benefiting from globally, and it's a very, very uh, a, a good synergy between the two companies today, which we are building strength to strength as well. I mean, if there is a front for potential expansion uh, beyond India, where would that be? Or are you going to focus on your home market? I think the India is such a big market. India is uh, growing very fast. Uh, if you look at the electricity demand in India is growing at 7% CAGR year on year, uh, when the rest of the world is around 2%. So uh, it's uh, both uh, national interest and economic interest to stay focused and concentrated in uh, solving this uh, big uh, you know, challenge uh, and opportunity ahead yeah. of us. But uh, we will look at uh, other places where we can add value and we will uh, maybe share those plans uh, as time goes by. But right now, I think we are very focused on uh, making our um, bets in India successful. Amita, thank you for clarifying uh, some of these uh, issues, as it were. Uh, that's uh, Amit Singh coming on uh, on a very important day for Adani Group stocks. Uh, it's been on a tear. He, Amit Singh, the CEO of Adani Green Energy. Still much more to come. Francine is going to be joined by BlackRock's uh, Vice Chair, Philip Hildebrand. This is Bloomberg. everybody. So today, Climate Finance Day here at COP28. Senior figures in the world of finance have really been calling for better data around emissions and, of course, the viability of green projects in order to unlock more investment. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined by Philip Hildebrand, who's the vice chair of BlackRock. Philip, thank you for joining us. I mean, good we always morning, talk, of course. Good afternoon, good I afternoon. guess. <laughs> I'm not sure. Good morning for our London views, because they're the ones that tune in the most. When you look at some of uh, the climate initiatives here, I know there's a lot of questions about, you know, the phasing out of fossil fuel. There's a lot of questions on the carbon markets and carbon credits. But then we have the loss and damage fund. So are you optimistic that, you know, we're day four and we've already achieved something? Yeah, I think we've achieved something. I mean, this is like a, a huge Greek play with lots of different actors. So it's hard to tell, you know, where it concludes or when it concludes. We're about halfway through. Uh, I think there are some positive elements. To me, the most important one, perhaps, is we're beginning to see actual private capital formation uh, designed to go into the emerging world. 
uh, in order to invest in the in the climate transition. I think that's you know to me when you look at the overall challenge, if we can't solve for that, then we won't make it. So th this is the key piece of it. And and now we've moved from just talking about it, recognizing it as a problem to early stages, early signs of capital formation out of the private sector to be mobilized for the transition. But then we need to put it somewhere. So then the capital formation, so like how hard is it to find the right projects exactly. at speed? Exactly. So I think that, you know, first was recognizing it as the main problem. Now, various announcements um, from the hosts, from Singapore, from many other places, we were involved in it. You're beginning to see private capital being kind of created, formation of private capital. Now comes the big questions, where are the products? How do we make sure it goes into the right projects, into the weakest regions, in a sense, in this? And, and that's going to be, the, to me, that is the, the, the key message coming out of here. If we can't solve for this, we're not going to tackle this, uh, this existential problem of climate change. But, Phil, how much of a chance is there that we do have some kind of comprehensive carbon markets, right, um, even language, that holds together in the next couple of weeks? Uh, I think that's difficult. To me, you know, I was thinking in the car over here, what's, what's kind of one of my future takeaways? And the carbon market is something we have to kind of wrestle with, I think, the community as a whole. Uh, that's, in a sense, the next stage. That has to be part of it as well. So we have all these elements. We have reduction of emissions, new technology, carbon markets, um, you know, air capture. Many people don't like this, but that is going to be clearly part of it. The involvement of industry. This was the first time that really you had heavy industry, including oil and gas, that was part of this COP. Those are positive signs. But I think at, at the moment, I want to kind of emphasize just the importance of getting capital to the emerging world. And, and here I'm beginning to see some progress. We need the projects, as you said. And that's, by the way, where, where the MDB reforms, MDB discussions are going to be very important. The World Bank needs to think of itself not as a competing agent to the private sector, but as an enabling agent. Same with the other MDBs. And, and there's some progress there, particularly at the regional level, that gives me some hope. And it feels certainly like the new president of the World Bank has really put this at the forefront of what he wants to achieve, right? Identifying some of these projects. The problem is that Indonesia is very different from Vietnam. It has also local regulations. So do you think that we'll be able to manage the transition or, or at least the readaptation in time? I hope so. I mean, what I'm a little worried about is that, you know, that there's a lot of focus on the really big problem, changing the capital structure of the World Bank. From my experience in the, in the public sector, that's going to be really hard. So I would encourage him, and he's done a great job, you know, in the first few months, encourage him to look at the things that you can really change, the mindset of the institution, getting out of the, not competing with the private sector, but enabling, empowering the private sector, making the projects. They are closer, the MDBs are closer to the projects in many cases in the private sector. Make those projects available now that we're beginning to see some formation of private capital. Uh, so, you know, I would, I would think it's important to, to think of the, the reform of the World Bank, not just at the level of the capital structure and the, the stakeholders, but also at how do you change the internal kind of workings of the World Bank in that regard. So how complex is this in a world that's ever-changing, where we're seeing huge rallies and then bets on a Fed rate cut, which could be imminent? I mean, the world is volatile, the world is evolving, so where does climate change financing come into this? This is very hard. Hard things are hard. You, you look at these uh, kind of newspaper articles that talk about you know, how little progress we made, but we've had a pandemic. We have a war in the middle of Europe. We have another war you know, in, in this region. So this is, this is really hard to do all this, to ensure that it's fair and just, that we have growth. Industry has to be part of this. I don't see how you do it any other way. So this discussion, by definition, is difficult, it's hard, and we have to just chip away at it day by day and, and make progress where we can. Again, to me, the core is we have, we have got to mobilize private capital for the emerging world to fund this transition. If you look at the need, I mean, we need about a 15 to 24 times increase, let's say a 20-fold increase in the investment flows into the emerging world. That's not going to be funded by the public sector. The private sector has to step in. Private capital has to be mobilized. And I think, to me, that's, you know, at least the first few days, there's a hopeful message coming out of this. I mean, I guess maybe it was difficult as interest rates kept on going up. Do you think we've reached peak rates? Well, I, I think we're probably close to it. What we're going to struggle with now is we have a lot of production constraints globally. The geopolitics are fragmented. 
demographics are putting constraints on it, which means, in my mind, that it's going to be harder for central banks. They're going to have bigger, they're going to face more difficult trade-offs between output and inflation. So we'll probably have more volatile, more volatility in markets. We'll have less trending markets. Beta will be less of a force. So the macro environment, I would say, is going to be in a sense, more challenging than what we've seen during the great moderation. And in all of that, you know, lower trend growth, higher volatility, higher interest rates, uh, that's going to make this, this climate fight more difficult. There's no question about it in my mind. But lower trend growth, not, not a recession. Yeah, I don't think that's so important in a sense. You know, the, the ch it looks like we can avoid a recession. Uh, but I think now that, w that we've mostly normalized the post-pandemic distortions, inflation has come way down, is still coming down, uh, interest rates hopefully have peaked. But, you know, the next challenge is now how do we operate in a world that is constrained on the production side globally, which leads to, I think, bigger trade-offs for central banks, more difficult trade-offs, probably lower trend growth and higher interest rates, and at the margin, stickier inflation. That's going to make uh, the policy challenge more difficult. Do you think the Fed will, I mean, the market is definitely pricing in Fed cuts maybe earlier than the Fed governors are, are you know, they're kind of pushing back against the markets quite a lot. Like, how, they've been pushing back for the last six months. Every six months there's like a fear in the market. They, they get kind of talked off a ledge. It's fine. And then after six months there's always this fear. Yeah, this like, is a, a lot of this in my mind. I would be skeptical on, on the sort of rapid, uh, you know, rate cut story. Mostly because I think a lot of people in the market are still thinking in terms of the old world. So we're going to, you know, get into weak growth. Therefore, central banks can cut. My message would be, you know, we need to be prepared for a different type of overall macro environment. Global production constraints, more difficult trade-offs for central banks, less ability to respond to weakness by immediately cutting interest rates, higher rates on average, lower growth. So we need to think of not a return to the old business cycle model, but kind of a a new world that is shaped by these production constraints. Now, if we can resolve them, if we can resolve the wars, if we can, you know, make progress on the transition, that will help to expand the production capacity of the global economy. That's the key objective, in a way, for, if you look at it in a, in a broad policy sense. But Phil, so what does that look like? And also, I was looking at, the, you know, figures of onshoring and investment in the U.S. I mean, they've gone through the roof. I mean, you yeah. literally have a chart Absolutely. that was flat and then... It's just taken it's, off. It's, uh, think of it as a rewiring of the global economy that, you know, unbalanced leads to higher costs, which leads to more production constraints, which leads to, you know, higher inflation on average, lower growth. And so this is a more, I would say, a more challenging world. It doesn't mean there are no opportunities. Investors are going to find great opportunities in this, but we're going to see less trending markets, more volatility, and for the policy world, more difficult trade-offs, which is why it's not as simple as to say, oh, growth is weakening, therefore central banks will be able to cut rates rapidly. I think that's, a, uh, that's too, too much anchored in the previous world. We're now in a new regime, uh, which is a different one. And so I think you know, that's what we need to kind of wrestle with, this, this new environment. Yeah, you have these competing forces. Philip, as always, thanks so much for joining us. That was Philip Hildebrand there, the vice chairman of BlackRock. Now, we'll have plenty more uh, to come here from COP here in Dubai. This is Bloomberg. Now, the most important challenge that we have for our security is to control the fundamental supply chains, and energy is one of, that, of those, and that is why Italy is working hard on that. Well, that was the Italian Prime Minister, Giorgia Meloni, speaking on the sidelines of COP on taking control of energy supply chains. She wants to put uh, Europe really at the forefront of some of this. Now, today is Finance, Trade, Equality and Accountability Day at COP28, with bankers and investors really calling for better data to boost green investment. Now, joining us uh, to understand the latest events is Bloomberg's head of green, ESG and equality, is our very own John Frauer. John. Thank you so much, and congratulations really to the team here on the ground that have been reporting nonstop to try and get us scoops. First of all, how does energy and the energy complex figure in this? And we're talking about transitioning, we're talking about becoming more energy efficient, and we're talking about phasing out fossil fuel. Like, what's most important? 
Well, I think the most, one of the most interesting things about this COP, but this is the first COP where we've seen the oil and gas industry come to COP. This was something that President Dr. Sultan al Jabbar was very uh, keen to do. Uh, we saw the oil and gas majors signing up to an agreement to cut their methane emissions on one of the first days of COP. Big, 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 dramatic announcement. However, also extremely controversial. A lot of climate activists say they're only cutting their methane emissions. They're not actually talking about phasing down uh, fossil fuels. And interesting, you know, I think it was the CEO of Exxon said, you know, COP has spent too long talking about renewables and not enough talking about oil and gas. Again, those are, co those are comments guaranteed to wind up uh, the, climate, the climate activists who have been coming here for years. So quite controversial. What about Finance Day? So again, G fans, I mean, some of the, the real pledges on finance was only two years ago in Glasgow. Right. So I don't know whether we're expecting too much or whether you're frustrated because it's too slow. Well, I think everyone would agree this is happening much too slowly. I mean, I think what we're seeing here at this COP, and today especially, today is Finance Day, we are seeing the largest number of bankers ever come to COP uh, today. And the challenge here is how do you turn billions of dollars into trillions of dollars? So billions of dollars have been pledged, but to get the energy transition going around the world, we need tens of trillions of dollars invested um, over the next you know, 10, 20 years. So what the bankers are talking about is how can we create mechanisms, carbon offsets, for example, carbon markets, to actually accelerate this flow to the countries that need it the most, because governments don't have the money it, to make this energy transition happen in a just and equitable way. It need, if the only other place where it can come from is the private sector. So what's the biggest barrier? Once you have the money, like how do you choose a project? I mean, this could be smaller projects, for example, for coal fire plants in Indonesia. They could yeah. be for you know, water renewables in Vietnam. So it's very difficult also to have a template for a lot of these projects. Yes, and they are, there are lots of interesting projects happening around the world. That, I mean, the so-called Just Energy Transition Partnership. So Indonesia is one of the big ones uh, happening right now. But you're right, it is fiendishly difficult. You know, how do you get uh, countries to stop using... You can't get countries to stop using coal overnight. This is a process that will take 10, 20, uh, 30 years. So, you know, we saw the loss and damage fund being set up. Still lots of questions about how that will work. So we're really just in the beginnings of all of this. But, of course, we don't have that much time. Loss and damage, at least we have a fund. Yes. There's not that much money in it, but are you confident that this will make a meaningful difference? And, and it feels like this was prepared ahead of COP, yeah. right? That there was an agreement and we didn't see the fighting like previous years. That's right. I know that is one of the achievements of, of this COP. It's the, the loss and damage fund has been operationalized, to use, a, to use a horrible word. But again, with that, lots of questions about how will we disperse the money in that fund. All of these questions get very both technical, but also very political about who gets this money. So a long way to go. We're always operationalized here on Bloomberg. Absolutely. John Farrar, head of Green ESG and Equality. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, from COP28 here in Dubai. But throughout the day, we have some great interviews and some great panels coming up. This is Bloomberg.